Dude, not long time no hear. Great to talk to you again. Yeah, well, for sure. It's been like something like four years, I think. Really? Uh, yeah. we've, we've talked on chat, but we haven't actually done a conversation for a yeah, while, yeah, have we? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I've, I've been wanting to talk to you for a, a little while as well, not just to catch up, but I've even noticed through your channel as well, compared to other people that seem to stay kind of locked uh, that, that your life has sort of uh, changed and you've gone gone about and you've shown yourself doing different things and, and obviously myself as well. And it's sure. actually great to talk to a, a, a real person uh, instead of uh, talking to the same concrete fossilized avatars or, or, or watching them. <laughs> Talking to a brand. I mean, I mean the, the profit motive for a lot of people is paramount. And mm. obviously it's gotten to the point where only a very narrow, um, well, narrow, narrowly defined ways of presenting any information are profitable. Mm -hmm. Like you, you really have to have a cliche message and you really need to preach to the choir or you, you just aren't, aren't visible. And the big channels get ton of, tons of traffic and the little ones get none. So, you know, I mean, it seems like that's pretty well the case with any, any demographic. That doesn't mean it's, you know, that the big channels are necessarily quality. It just means that the, the popular channels are popular because they're popular. Yeah. But yeah. psychologically, I find it interesting because right now you're only seen and heard and feel like you belong to a group if you play that game. But if you dare step outside the walls of that community, no one's going to follow you outside the walls and, and talk like a human being and, and be more or less one-on-one, -on -one, uh, if oh, you know what I mean. Yeah. So I, I, I enjoy more one-on-one, -on -one, not just literally these conversations, but when I, the videos I tend to watch and the people I'm subscribed to are actual people and I'm, I'm watching a bubble of their life and they're moving sure. around the world and they're talking about things. Whereas, like you said, the, uh, uh, the popular things are like every, everyone's channel seems to be a game show in sure. one form or another with an yep. audience and, you know, the, the laugh track and all that, figuratively speaking. And sure. it, it, it feels like, okay, everything is entertainment. Even the man, woman thing, the, pretending to talk about relationships which really kind of makes the, the the hair stand up on the back of my head because it doesn't come across as genuine it comes across yep. like a david letterman game show and everyone's pretending to be really serious and stroking their beards yet they have you know eight bimbos with microphones on the other end and it's like you're not this isn't serious this is fun this is a conversation and i can get on board as long as we admit it but we're pretending that this is serious we we we're we're, we're, in, we're pretending this is an intelligent moral discussion yeah yeah for sure i mean and it and it's quite clear that very often there's really nothing being brought to the table but a collection of clichés that are really easily digestible right and it's the same crap over and over and over and over again. And it's designed for a lazy kind of person that's not interested in conversation, certainly not conversations about relating. They want to come in there and just get their belly full of the stuff that makes them comfortable. They don't mm. have the intent of that being... They want to take away something from the conversation, but they're not interested in any level of contributing to the advancement of any idea, right? Mm. And uh, I think you see that in a lot of stuff, unfortunately. Well, I, looking back, I remember, remember a few years ago, you and I went through a period where we had these discussions about relating ethics and morals and like I, sure. I did a string of videos on my like channel about that and I had chats with you and uh, one or two other people but mainly with you and I was really finding finding some gems in that and finding little answers for myself when I was going out there whether it was alone or in front of other people or, or dating or what have you and I really found that helpful and I kept digging in that area and I remember that was a 
a, a really interesting uh, and useful moment when I was having chats with you. We were both having chats with that. And I remember you you went through that period when I first discovered you and we started talking. And then you kind of let go of the whole uh, manosphere kind of thing and wanted to talk more as a human being and, and about relating. And I started to kind of join you in that, but kind of it kind of drifted away and you know the, the world happened the last couple of years and whatever sure but thinking back on it like i feel like in the last couple of years i've been at the point that you were at when i started talking to you oh. and it's <laughs> it's kind of like yeah quaz was right he was onto something here and i, I was i was holding on and then yeah. <laughs> like he he took off and i couldn't hold on you know the train left or whatever but now, the more i I look back, those those discussions were really useful and they were the way forward. Well, that's that's nice to hear. Um, I mean, it, it is it is, you know, it's it's material that is is deeply interesting to me. Um, and it, it becomes the whole the whole conversation about relating is much broader uh, than than people give credit to right i mean the nature of uh of our existence whether you feel it to be metaphysical or not is relational right it's certainly not objective mm. and um it, it's important to understand that there is at least as far as i've come to see a um a toolkit that a person develops over time by which you approach and interact anything that you don't define as yourself right but including things that you define as yourself as well and that there is a voice and a strategy and a, a way to approach and to interact and uh unfortunately it's it's high re highly reflexive too that i mean if you have strategies that you favor that um aren't super constructive either internally or externally will you you create an environment for yourself by by behaving that way that makes it just that much more so and if you are more inclined to uh, make your way through life by enriching your habitat um, then your habitat becomes more abundant as you go into the future as well so um, it's hard to convince people who, um, and by no fault of them themselves, come from cultures that have a tendency to be um, inherently exploitive. I mean, there are there are far <laughs> more people in our cultures that are takers than makers. You know, um, most of us live at a level of affluence that requires somebody being poor for that to happen maybe not in our own community, but somewhere. I mean, mm -hmm. that becomes obvious. There's a cost for it. And if we're healthy human beings, we at some level are aware of the fact that the tennis shoes that we're wearing are made by somebody that doesn't have a lot of opportunity, right? And yeah. it bothers us. It should bother you if you're healthy. Uh, but many of us are forced to somehow navigate this by shutting our empathy down. And as such, if we're not aware of why and how and that's that's being made necessary, then that becomes a strategy, is shutting the empathy down. And one gets number and number and number, and all relationships get more hollow uh, mm. because of that toolkit right well it's also the uh, as you mentioned reflexive it's the the reflexive nature of a person that if you you know um show empathy you, you make a conscious decision to uh, say it was unconscious when you were younger you're brought up that way and you're you're naively trusting and you've got empathy and you always want to be kind like you're just built that way Sure. more or less and then like patting a dog you get bitten once or twice you you think twice from a survival oh, point yeah. of view and and so in, in this case say in the west especially where the cruelest people seem to profit the the cruel entertainment where we laugh at people who fail or who have gotten 
uh, their relationships have failed or they've slipped and fallen on a banana peel and everyone joins in in the comment sections and saying, oh, what a dumbass. Yeah. And like yeah. that gets the, the, the worst kind of behavior gets attention and behavior at the expense of someone else's suffering. Then everyone thinks, well, I'm not going to even try and pat that dog because it, it it's almost guaranteed that it's going to bite back, figuratively speaking, from the environment in front of me. So everyone, I think quite rationally uh, from a survival point of view, is like, well, I'm going to think not just once, twice, three times, but infinitely before I actually show compassion. I will not trust my own judgment to kind of assess a person or a situation and say, you know what, I'll try and shake their hand. I will not trust myself and I'll think twice, three times, and I'll never shake someone's hand because you never know, they could bite me again. And I see this time and time again when I talk to guys about relationships. It's like, okay, yeah, there are these type of people and there are women like this, but don't continually never trust your judgment about assessing what's in front of you so that you can extend your hand and shake someone's hand and say hello and trust and, and assess whether someone's good enough to show empathy towards. And yeah, if someone goes towards biting you, you pull back. But this whole um, environment of we get off on pain, but we, we're, pretending, we're pretending we want to be hugged or we probably feel like we want to be hugged. Sure. Yet we get off on and kicking people in the stomach at the same time. And I feel like there's an impasse there. You, you can't have those two things going on at the same time. You can't get off on the cruelty and want to grow your YouTube channel by doing hateful material and uh, laughing and joking at someone else's pain. But at the same time, oh, why can't I find love? Why can't I find a friend? I feel alone. And it's like, well, make a decision. Which side of the fence do you want to lean in? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I I think uh, that this this uh, this um, situation that we're describing here is reaching a, um, a a level of crisis that it, that uh, in in many avenues of a person's life um, now, and it becomes. Um, certainly a source of dismay for a lot of people, even if they're not perhaps thoughtful or, or articulate enough to kind of work through what the root is. Um, but, you know, a good example of this would be, um, you know, I, I'm a tradesman. I work in the trades. I build houses. And, of course, I build boats now. But, like, in most parts of the Western world, you know, especially the established economies, the guy that builds a house is the least paid guy involved in the house yeah. like the banker who gives no value to the project of the house is paid more than the guy that builds a house the mortgage broker the insurance guy the real estate agent right mm. all, all of these people who do not create value i mean objectively they do not create value they take value they they create expense Mm -hmm. The house is more unaffordable because of their presence. But nothing that they are doing is contributing to the quality or the value of the home for the homeowner. Okay? Mm. And not infrequently, the banker thinks he's smarter than the builder. Right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And the realtor thinks he's smarter than the builder, that dumb knuck knuckle-dragger that's building the house. Right? Mm-hmm. Um... So, like, there, there is an attitude of just tremendous cynicism out there where if you're not the person that's stealing all the pizza off the table at the pizza party, you're somehow some kind of an idiot, right? Oh, yeah. You're a, uh, you're a dupe, you're a dupe, you're a fool. People that are the biggest cheaters are elevated as somehow being smart. But that's only because... Um, we don't recognize that an individual who is a big cheater is a big cheater in all aspects of their life, and they will never know empathy or love mm. or relationship because they have made a choice to inhabit a world where those things are demeaned. 
Well, I think a big reason for that is that uh, the world has stripped away any um, sort of a top of the pyramid value uh, that's got that's related to uh, say virtue or, or anything like that before, you know, there was like God or how you treated people, your, your standing in a community, things like that. I think sure. now the, the big prize, the, the gold medal, you know, the number one place on the podium is financially how much money you have. And yeah. so that's the only barometer. So now, and, and I agree with what you said, I can't stand when you see a video or you hear a story or someone brags about, Look at, I took advantage of this dumbass and look at everything I profited and everyone claps their hands and says, oh, well, that's smart. Who cares? The, the ends always justify the means. And I always think that how you win really matters. But these people think that no, any, any end, the, the ends of money and success justify any way you got there. And whether it's from the OnlyFans chick to the unscrupulous, cruel businessman who stepped on a, a million necks to get where he is. I really don't respect those people. And the fact that most people do, their barometer of success is not just that someone, it's not admirable if someone was a nice person, a decent person and became a billionaire. True. Who we watch and want to be is the cruel person, the sociopath. Who became a millionaire that's more attractive to look at to watch and to follow but the decent person who became a millionaire that's kind of like eh, whatever it's a boring story the exciting story is the drama filled one of the cruel person the sociopath the the villain and i mean without all these lessons that say you and i have talked about in in past discussions we talk about mythopoetic stories you've sure. gotten rid of the hero it's just that yeah. I know in stories that the villain is the most interesting personality, but all we have is the villain now. There's actually not you as the hero wrestling with an interesting personality, maybe, that's the villain. But the villain is the only person in the world. And that's why stories are so shit and movies are so shit. Yeah. And our relationships are so shit because we relate through stories primarily to learn lessons. And, and what's your lesson? That the... The, the hero is actually the villain. The hero acts like the villain and the villain gets the rewards and we should all be the villain. And like, good luck. Try, try, try relating and trusting friends and, and having a partner that you can trust with that kind of script and storytelling. It's like, well, you won't have it. Well, of course. And I mean, you would think that there would be some kind of farsightedness that would exist in people where you would ask. Well, if everybody chooses to behave this way and adopts this strategy, w what does the world look like? Mm. And yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, do you want to live in that world where everybody is a cheating, lying ass? I mean, if is that winning? I yeah. mean, how how is that possibly winning, right? I I don't actually even know how that a lot of people, especially younger people online, know what winning looks like. Winning yeah. looks like you you high-five your bro next to you that's just survived True. while everyone else is burnt. Yeah. And like it's that sort of dude bro, from a guy's point of view, it's that dude bro high-five, drunken sports bar kind of driving too fast, um, banging chicks without protection, just live fast, die young, and be an asshole. That's sure. winning. And to me, it's like, well, that's not what your grandfather would be proud of. He would look at you in disgust. And without any kind of mentors there to hold you accountable, that's what you get. You get Lord of the Flies. Kids, you know, the, the strongest, cruelest survive. And uh, now, now they're the, the ones that are the father figures like Andrew Tate's and, and whatever that the, the young fatherless kids uh, are sure. looking up to just because they've got a, a few supercars. Well, I mean, that's that's a strong Jungian observation that uh, that is really important to always keep forward. Like, uh, if you're not able to love, you will seek power. Mm. Right. He he makes it very clear, and it's a very prof it's a very important um, argument that 
never confuse hate as the antithesis of love, but power. I've never heard that before. Admittedly, yeah, I haven't read Jung, but that's um, that's actually well, that's really a, astute. That's a big one, right? To think about if if he's correct in that assessment, and it, you know, I think a little reflection on that is useful for anybody, mm. because very typically you find very quickly <laughs> with some people that the relationship you have with them is all about power. Yeah, the as soon as you mentioned that, I, I automatically looked at the feeling it gives you. What's the feeling of power compared to the feeling of love? Both yeah. of them swell you up full of the a, a very, very similar emotion if you don't pay attention, and they can actually sure. feel very similar. Point in fact, look at when you have sex. Yeah. It can feel really similar. You can you can you can be full of um, adrenaline and emotion to a person that you love, but in the bedroom, it, it's almost completely power in certain moments. Though you wouldn't think of hurting a hair on their head, but those two emotions are really similar in certain ways. So you, you, that's yes. that's a really yep. that's an astute observation. That's really good. It is an astute observation, right? But. Uh, the issue um, is that you will find that, uh, you know, control, obviously. There's, there's mm. not really any good reason for control to exist within love. But, but certainly there's plenty of reason for control to exist within power. And because I, I think people are kind of not super thoughtful about this aspect... This is why, especially in the men's stuff, the most of the garbage out there that's that's sent to men to somehow figure out how to relate to women is utterly power based. Yeah, right? completely. It's utterly yeah. transactional. It's utterly like you want to put yourself into a position of dominance mm. so that you can bend people to your will, right? Mm -hmm. Um, you control control all of that stuff, right? Which just assures again, you will never have quality in intimacy in your life. You will never, uh, you'll never be loved. Well, if you're looking for, if you're trying to be real and honest in your life, and I think when you do that, your life becomes a lot easier, and you reduce a lot of existential fear. And if you sure. just try and calibrate your life to control you can be the tyrant that yeah. has dominion over all your servants and they bow down to you but the moment you you realize you you don't know if you've got a judas there that's ready to stick the knife in and <clears throat> was it judas who was the one that stabbed caesar or mm -hmm. was it cicero I can't remember. But anyway, you can be the ruler that's always worried who's going to stab you in the back because you're do you're ruling people with fear, but you're you're telling yourself that they all love you. And yeah. it's an existential mindfuck for me because when you can honestly relate to people and and I want to touch on something you mentioned a moment ago between love and power. And I I think that's a very important one because they both give you at the end of them why you want them is they both give you a sense of security. If you can actually trust and love somebody, you have a good relationship with them, whether it's platonic or romantic, you have a sense of security about them. Sure. If you can dominate someone, you can also have a sense of security. And I think that what you mentioned with these guys being taught that, you know, dominate a woman, uh, she's just an empty, empty shell that needs to occupy your frame, so to speak. So essentially yeah. have a partner like a dog that's, with you under Stockholm syndrome rather than proper re relational sort of uh, values where they're a, a different person to you and you're, you've got this really nice feedback loop happening where you're treating each other decently like a good friend would, you know? And, and that's why I've often talked on my channel over and over again, look for friend qualities in sure. a romantic partner and uh, you'll get a ton of guys that have been taught in this power-based way you've mentioned they just laugh at you and say well that that's just one step away from being taken advantage of by all these sharks out there that have dresses on and it's like well if you insist on seeing the world that way then you are completely right and keep going about it but if you don't try and change 
uh, your perspective that you don't insist on seeing things dif differently. And I'm not saying be naive, be no, realistic no. about this thing and assess people correctly. But if you say that every woman can potentially ruin you, which, okay, objectively, you're, you're right, it's accurate, but your attitude about it and how you assess things and whether you know what a friend looks like and whether you insist on looking for friend qualities in a partner or not is up to you. But if you insist on looking at them like a, a dog that is to be trained, roll over and is fearful of you, and is grateful to be fed and wags its tail and no matter how you treat it it's always happy if you if you want a dog master relationship go for it but stop complaining to me and the world how men aren't treated well you're a five-year-old that wants to treat a dog cruelly you are not a person that wants to relate to someone fairly and when when the chips are down you can rely on this other friend or partner to support you and be an adult and have a brain. Because if you want a a girlfriend that resembles a pet, then when you need them, they're just gonna be wagging their tail looking for a treat. They're not gonna be able to, to be there for you and you're gonna be really disappointed at that moment and then it'll be too late. Yeah, I mean, and who knows if somebody doesn't come along with a better treat. Good point, yeah. Oh, yeah, so. yeah, all women monkey branch. Well, yeah, dogs will take a treat from anyone. <laughs> yeah, they sure will, right? <laughs> That's well, a I good mean, point. You know, you know, it's it's totally natural, I mean, it, you know, to use the metaphor of getting burnt, um, to have a fear response. I mean, that's a childish, infantile response, but it's innate, right? Mm -hmm. But, like, just because you had a sip of coffee at one point in your life and you burnt your lip on it doesn't mean you have to forever be terrified of coffee you know you you could learn to drink it out of a different cup or you could learn to let it cool down a little bit right or you know there's skill that you can apply to this situation um so that you can approach something that is potentially dangerous in a manner that it won't hurt you yeah. Right. So, I mean, while it's it's natural, of course, to get these fear responses and to perhaps even take these fear responses and run with them into a power dynamic, because that's how you uh, chose choose to live your life most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, it, I mean, I think it should be obvious to people that that's not the only way of going about stuff. I, I know that there would be tons of guys out there who would be listening to you and I talk about this and they would just be snarking, quoting oh, yeah. one cliche after another saying, Oh no, that never happens. It happens a hundred percent of the time and all that. And <clears throat> you know, I, it's hard to blame them because they hear this crap all the time. And I mean, for sure, I mean, I would also say the majority of the people I interact are emotionally crippled, right? Mm -hmm. They carry tremendous amounts of, of trauma. Most of the self-help out there is garbage. It doesn't really get into these, you know, essential core things like assessing whether you want to relate with love or power. You don't hear that kind of stuff, right? No, no, no. Um, I mean, I don't expect everybody to have the native curiosity to go kind of solve these problems for themselves, but I mean, optics are the enemy of many people. Like there is a very dominant way that people go about things and think about these things to the point where, um, examples of people that choose otherwise are even though they exist, are just about uh, absent, you know? Yeah, they, they don't have the kind of mature nuance to, as you said, look at it from these perspectives. Guys will be listening to us and they roll their eyes because they think, well, I'm smarter because you're saying if I touch the stove and it's hot and then I'll, I'll, I'll figure out a different way to do it because I really want to drink, I don't know, a coffee or something. And it's, it's the only way to do it. I know I want this and there's a way to do it and I'm not being delusional, there's a way to have a cup of coffee. And I don't just stop. And, but these guys will say, well, I'm smarter than you, old man, because I don't even try and make a cup of coffee. 
So therefore, sure. I'm, I never get burnt. So I win. I, I never feel pain. I never feel loss. I don't waste my time. I'm perfect from an infant to the grave. Whereas you tr fall and waste time and get your heart broken and blah, blah, blah. Look at me. It's just sunshine every single day, or they'll tell you it is anyway. And yeah. there's nothing to say to a person like that. But sometimes I, I tell these guys that listen to, you know, the power-based uh, rhetoric of how to get women and how to succeed in life. And they'll say, oh, well, start a business. And I'll say, okay, 90% of businesses fail, correct? Yeah. Yes. Sure. Okay. Yet only 50 to 60% of relationships fail. Bigger sure. chance of success, but you're scared to death and you think there's no skill involved in a relationship, but you'll all keep hammering towards having a, a business. Sure. Why? It's the, If you're being rational, you guys are being complete morons. Like you should be concentrating much more on, on relationships with, with people or, or lovers because you've got a greater chance of success. But you're saying, no, 100% failure in that no matter what you do. But business, where you've got such a small margin of success... It's like, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a successful business. Why? Because you, you want to have a car and you want to have a bimbo in the passenger seat that you can bang, that you feel safe. It's all a five-year-old's power fantasy. Yeah. And unless the guy wants to... Re all these guys that look at, you know, they talk about uh, the bio biological side of how women are and how men are, and they just look at the bias of what will... Um, confirm the the argument or the scared part of life that they want to confirm. They'll say, "Oh, women are like this. They monkey branch, and their nature is like this." And they they talk about evolution as an excuse yeah. to to do nothing. And I say, "Well, you keep talking about evolution, but you don't want to evolve yourself. No. You don't want to evolve from your five year old point of view." So, all of these maths and science and observation, they'll cherry pick rather than okay. I can agree with some of their points of view when they say there are women in the West that are like this and they're transactional and they're very materialistic. It's fine. Yep. But the moment I say, oh, look, I agree with you. Now, l listen to my rational arguments like, no, you, can, you only can talk in their church, otherwise they won't speak to you. Well, that's because they suck at relating. <laughs> they suck at relating to you too. Yeah. It's amazing to me how... You can't talk to them about any kind of skill in life. No, no that's right. Everything is predetermined, yet they complain. And I feel like, why are you complaining if you accept that there's no free will and there's no skill involved in you relating to other people and there's no choice? Why are you complaining? Why are you resisting something that you are telling me you believe in? You should just be a docile cow in the field well, see you know? but i think there is something you can say to them but i don't think they would listen either but i think it's worth thinking about is that you may be able to hide from relationships with women and you, that's fine you may be able to hide from relationships with i don't know other people or the, the world or all these other things that you you can withdraw into a bubble of isolation right mm -hmm. If you find it too painful and you are unskilled at uh, interacting with other without getting burnt or somehow injured, all right, but you do have a relationship with your internal self and the same skills that you have developed with Chicky Poo are going to be the same skills you use talking to yourself with your inner voice in those quiet moments. And if it's based on cruelty and power, you'll be cruel and uh, domineering to yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you cannot I, escape that. And that will I think be we, miserable. We talked about this, and I think I did a video way back in the day, uh, just before I was talking to you. I was like stumbling across these little things as I was reading and um, mm. uh, writing myself about uh, what's the what's the friend you have in what's the dialogue you have with uh, sure. the voice inside or how do you speak to yourself and I've made videos like this where a, a big revelation to me when uh, there was that you know that sort of midlife turning point that a lot of guys and, and girls but hopefully have but a lot of people don't 
where you start actually writing down honestly your, your feelings on paper and how you think and the mistakes and you're just laying it bare, no excuses. And the really interesting th thing to me was the language. I was reading my words and I was like, fuck, is this how I actually speak? To, like, I don't talk like this. Yeah. But the words coming out of my head was like, is this how I think to myself? Is this how I, is this the, the vernacular in my head? Most of, us, most of us, unless we deliberately try otherwise, are quite cruel to ourselves. Mm. And, and funnily enough, I, the language I found foreign, I didn't recognize the person on the paper. Sure. Although he wasn't as cruel as I generally I hear other people uh, have an inner voice. So just naturally, I don't have a, I've never had a really cruel inner voice. Although when I did read my words, they did not seem like me. And that was yeah. very confronting because sure. there was a lot of um, unnecessary victimhood. There was a lot of kind of obsequiousness and kind of excuses and, and just the language, I didn't recognize the words that I'd use in public to people and, and the way I talk to others. Sure. The voice on paper was very, very different. But I noticed friends of mine, they really have a cruel voice. And I don't understand why they're so cruel. Uh, but it, there is, I, I agree, that exercise of really laying everything out on paper and being honest, you will be surprised how different that is if you if you read them does that sound like you? And, and I would say for nine out of 10 people, it, 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 it isn't. And that should be a turning point by which you can decide, hopefully, to um, speak differently to yourself. And what you mentioned is really astute and, and important too. If you talk like crap to yourself and you have an awful, um, uh, what do they call it? Um, uh, the, the internal voice in psychology, what's that term called again? Um the inner parent, there's a word for it in psychology. Yeah, I, I mean, remember. there's a lot of ways that spawn, but sure. But um, yeah, if if that's the, the, the terrible friend you have, the awful voice, what do you think your potential, you know, Jane sitting across from you on a date hears and feels and, and relates yeah. to? Well, I mean, what it, what it proves is that you are a power-seeking tyrant, mm -hmm. right, who on occasion will feign... Um, some patina of empathy to try to dominate somebody into uh, a relationship. Yeah, right? you'll be you'll you'll have the sociopath voice inside you going on a date and saying, "How can we how can we lure her into into our back home? Yeah, how can we lure right. her into a conversation?" So you'll always approach relationships like a car salesman because you won't show them from the get-go, the real no. you, because the real you will repel everybody. Yeah, I mean, and that's the nature of uh, perpetrators of violence at all levels. Like, no, the idea that, you know, somebody just jumps out of the woods and attacks you, I, I mean, that's something that almost never happens. It's mm. almost always the case that somebody approaches and worms their way into your space first, generally through deceit or something else, right? Mm -hmm. And then the cruelty and the power uh, comes out. Because yeah. if you led with it, like you wouldn't, you wouldn't even get a chance to get close, right? No. I mean, some of the... There are really good lessons that I suppose even like any religions or any sects or anything like that, but even in the Mansphere, the very basic entry-level stuff that gets people in the door is really useful. Like, you know, the cliches of if you go on a date, you know, look at how she treats the wait waiters and waitresses sure. and uh, her temper. and th that, that is all great. But then after that, very quickly, it just goes into reality TV land. But that stuff is... When I, I've spoken to people that say, well, human, every guy who who uh, moved in with a woman or married a woman was 100% sure, but look at what look at what happens to almost every guy. And then when I talk to those same guys and I say, okay, when you met Chicky Poo, uh, what was she like when you were dating? Uh, what was her temper like? Yeah, she had a bit of a temper all the time. And she was always like this. And so, so 
if you're curious enough and honest, you see these things, you talk about them, you will discover their personality. It doesn't blindside you. Like you said, it doesn't just jump out of the woods. The problem is these people don't talk. They they, they really don't talk. And I think discussion and open conversation between two people is the the lifeblood, the the lubricant by which you can actually trust whether the person is who they say they are as much as you can. But if you don't, like most people don't, then you're just trusting your fantasies and sweeping things under the rug. And I, if I buy her another dress, she'll be happy. If I marry her, she'll be happy. If I, like, so you're afraid if you don't do all these things and keep the tyrant happy, that things will fall apart. That's the truth. It wasn't that she was a perfect, honest human being that you could trust. And all of a sudden she talked, turned into Jekyll and Hyde. It's you ignored Hyde and you thought that Jekyll was all that was there, uh, whether she was acting or not. Yeah, I mean, at, at some point, um, although it can be a surprisingly long time before it emerges, at some t- a point, you as a, you know, call it a partnership, will be forced to make a choice which is a compromise, mm-hmm. Right. At some point, but it could take a long time. You ever say you're a professional couple that's been dating and you like to watch TV and you like to go have dinner and you like to do this and that and the other thing and you're living two more or less isolated, independent lives that you kind of shack up on occasion short term, right? Mm-hmm. You don't really do anything together. Right. You've never discovered in that person whether or not... Um, at any meaningful sense, you can compromise, right? And if your if your relationship is not love based, meaning that you are e- you are eagerly seeking the fulfillment of your partner's needs, right? If you mm-hmm. don't, if you're not that kind of person, and she's not that kind of person, then it's going to be a power dynamic, and yep. because of that, it's going to likely spiral out of control really quick. And there's going to be a lot of Jekyll and Hyde that comes out of that. And it's always been there. It's just that very, uh, um, it's been all too easy to avoid the circumstances that make that kind of interaction necessary. Mm. Yeah, everyone more or less has probably got a hide inside of them that comes out when they're threatened. And if you don't lead with uh, honest relating and love and whatever, then um, the buck stops with that because every living organism's prime directive is to survive. You know, sure. You've got some broken uh, psychological people that have been beaten down by childhood and they will just let someone destroy them. There's no limits to that. But they're very rare. Uh, sure. When people are cornered, uh, people might have a long fuse by the time they'll, they'll lash out to survive. But if you're not relating properly, if it's just a power dynamic, you can push someone and push them, but they will snap. And yeah. it it almost always, it's almost a guarantee, not always, like I said, there are dysfunctional, broken people, but almost always it, it's the case. I think about myself when I was uh, in school, I was generally a pretty agreeable, nice person, but once or twice bullies cornered me and I... I I, you know, submitted, submitted, and I didn't want to fight. But then when they cornered me and wanted to fight, I snapped. And I think everybody does, no matter how much. And the nicest girl will as well, if you relate with the power dynamic, every living living organism's last directive is to live. And they will lash out. Yeah. And that's not an unhealthy thing necessarily. No. It's an innate thing, right? Hmm. But uh, yeah, once the love is gone, power is all you got. But if you start with power. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the problem. And I mean, unfortunately, that's been normalized. Mm. Right. Um, and I I just, I, I am baffled by that. And I, I think it's just an impossibly destructive characteristic of our culture. Unfortunately, until until a person di- makes a conscious decision that they want to be different, that they want to find solutions, that they're tired of yesterday, that they want tomorrow to be different, un- until you get to that turning point where uh, I was a per- one person yesterday, but now I'm going to be someone else, you make that decision. It well, won't change. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, and it's it's almost not even countercultural. It's almost extra cultural, meaning like you have the power dynamic and you have people that tend to be um, averse to interaction with other people. Right. What do you, what do you the, mean the, I, by extra cultural? Can you explain that a little bit more? Well, what I mean by extra cultural is a value that exists, but it is completely outside of it's not even recognizable it mm. doesn't even show up on the radar of the values of the culture because the culture is so so distal from that way of thinking mm. right you know yep. like here would be a, here would be an example from from ecology okay so like often um you hear conversations where capitalism and, say, socialism are compared as opposite ends of the spectrum, but they are objectively not, right? What, what they are are a debate on the same spectrum where cultures are choosing who gets to own the property. Should it be held by private citizens or should it be held by government, right? The extracultural yep. view which has been the dominant view for most of human existence, is that no one should own the land. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so, that, so the idea that the land should not be owned by anybody, that's, an extra, that's the kind of thing that I mean by extracultural. That yeah, is something like a that more a, never get discussed, right? Yeah, more a natural, universal sort of way of thinking, and the other one's yeah. more a kind of synthetic, manufactured, like post-civilization... Um, way of thinking. Yeah, it's an abstraction, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so, like, I think that we run into something that's quite similar in the uh, ecology of relating between people, right? Mm -hmm. That uh, it's, it's about power, or it's perhaps about power or about submission, but the idea that human beings would interact with the desire to meet the needs of other people Right, that that's what mm -hmm. you, you're leading with. You're like you're like I would like to do something nice for you. Yeah, right. That seems to be pretty well um, extra cultural to me, at least in any any kind of meaningful sense. Well, even uh, I, I find it really interesting that guys don't trust their their eyes and feelings about what makes them feel good or nervous or, or fearful that when you say something like say uh, you're we'll use the, the example of like a, a a girlfriend or or a female romantic partner because when you talk about friends like guys are like yeah fine you do something nice for your friend it doesn't matter like no skin off my nose like it's great i don't care if i get anything back but there's this kind of fear and i i say what's wrong with doing something nice for your chick as and they're like well then she's going to take advantage of you you do nothing for them and yeah i've I, th th that extra view you're talking about is like no, no, no. The natural view, this extra view you, you made, but let's just call it the natural universal view, is that the, 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 you know, doing something nice for somebody else. Say a parent for some, a child. Yeah, but it gives something back to you, right? I can't explain it to you mathematically, but I know artistically, I know it's, it's, it's a very similar thing. The, the biggest gift I can give to myself is sharing my gift. Yeah. Right. So if I m share something with somebody else with words or gestures or whatever, you do get this. It, it, it's kind of like a circuit that keeps coming back, this really nice feedback loop. But if you are just like you said, whether it's just taking and never giving anything back and then you just keep putting your foot on the accelerator and, and going faster and faster and taking more and more and more and you think you will you, you will have the most when uh, you reach the grave at the end of your life and that's victory to you. Uh, you haven't enjoyed your life. You're, you're, yeah. you're, you're looking for an abstract um, destination at the end that just doesn't e exist. I, I find it, um, yeah, laughable, the accumulation of some sort of 
it's it's really weird to kind of talk to guys and say what what's wrong with feeling good by trusting someone what's good wrong with feeling good by doing something really like can you deny how good it feels to to do something good for your brother sister family member best friend and just see the look on their face and you and you get a flood of endorphins and yeah. th they they just reduce relationships to this mechanical cold clinical well i got something on my own without them and I'm the ruler of my own world and no one can touch me. And it's just, it's bizarre. It's very video game-like. Yeah, I mean, it's it's um, it's a bit retarded, right? Yeah, it's deranged. Like, I mean, it's fu fun fundamentally, right? Like, I mean, for, you know, I mean, let's just, let's just use an, a very basic example. Let's say that you're on a road trip with four people in a car that you don't know, mm -hmm. would you rather have the road trip with people that were grouchy and unsociable or that were sociable and pleasant? The latter. Yeah, I would too, right? See, because what, what we're saying here is that an individual that is leading with a little empathy creates mm. an in a very simple environment that enriches themselves in a manner that isn't transactional. You're not asking for anything back. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. What, what you've done is by delivering value into this environment, now you have the benefit of being on a road trip with people that are pleasant to be around rather than it just be this grim exercise in managing exhaustion. Mm-hmm. See, so it, it doesn't have to be something like, well, I'm not going to tell a joke because I don't know if he won't tell a joke back. Some kind of stupidity like that. <laughs> I, I think that just basically it goes back to what you said earlier about the inner voice. Like if you don't have a good inner voice, a good inner dialogue, and you're fearful inside and all you do is present a mask to, to um, fool people or to ride that car trip, long enough to get it in, to a destination at the expense of others and to fake who you are in that car. It's not sure. a good way to be. You're better off addressing the, the fundamental, the root cause of your inner dialogue. And then when you get into the car, be yourself, have a good disposition, don't have the fear. And uh, rather than masking all the inner shit that you don't want to address, and faking your way through that car trip of life with people or going just going through succession after succession of honeymoon periods of dating like you know a couple of weeks end of relationship a couple of months end of like and it's just a cycle because you can't keep holding your breath in that car for long enough like you need to address that like who you are be re refine that person know what sure. you want and then when you get into that car you don't have to try. You don't have to scheme. You don't have to know what lines to say. You don't have to know what witty jokes to have up your sleeve for the duration of the car trip. And with people who are in relationships like that, I feel like, okay, if, if you're like a stand-up comedian that's got a great set that goes for an hour, what happens when that set's over and you ha don't have any more material for that sure. relationship? Because then it's over, right? Because yep. you should, don't have jokes, be funny. So you need to be a funny person. You don't have to know jokes. That you don't absolutely. have to, you don't have to be witty and clever and I know how to do this and I know psychology and women want this. It's like, no, just be a really, a, a, a version of yourself that you're really proud of and turn up as that without a script and fumble your way through it and don't care because you know there's nothing wrong with you however yeah. imperfect you are but no no i've got to be this perfect instagrammable 1.2 million uh, to 1.2 million likes on youtube channel kind of personality that's the sure. person i have to be it's like no you yeah. don't no you don't uh, I, oh, I, I, I laugh it in the comment section. Sorry, I keep cutting you off. But no. um, I laugh in the comment section with the guys recently because I've always 
had turning points in my channel. You've seen from when I just showed my, uh, had my voice with no face and sure. I showed my face. Like I've just gone, my channel's always just been evolving given where I am and where my life is going and what I'm interested in. And it's yep. amazing now how over the last few months, people have said, well, humans uh, ruined his channel. And I'm like, really? I thought I saved my channel. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, like they just look at the numbers going down and it's like, wow, he's completely ruined his channel. And it's like, no, nah, like I think I did the other thing, but I can see how you think that. Yeah, but see, again, I mean, again, it's, it's, it's the transactional power kind of relating, man. Hmm. You know, I mean, it certainly has a tendency to, I mean, a per, I mean, like, I mean, here's, a, here's another way that, uh, I mean, this could, let's say, let's apply the power versus love dichotomy to something that might not on the surface seem like it's, um, like a place where it would be a good insight. Okay, so let's let's contemplate one's relationship to knowledge. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's an interesting relationship, but it's a it's a relationship for sure, right? There is a way that you approach the things that you claim you know, mm -hmm. right? And um, there's a toolkit by which you go about. Um, building a personal zeitgeist of the things that you claim to be your reality, right? And sure. contrary to the little like Ben Shapiro types out there in the world, a lot of that just comes down to your preferences, right? Yeah, not sure. Your your your, your 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 ethical data, that, database. Yeah, yep. yeah. I mean, not to say that the world doesn't have facts. It does. I mean, a, a lot of them are fuzzier than we'd like to think. But yeah. what is not a fact and what is always irrational is your choice of what facts to look at, mm. right? There is no fact that dictates that. Yeah, I'm the, always reminded of the, of the quote, I might, be cer I, I might not be right even though I'm certain. Yeah, exactly. Or the, the metaphor of the flashlight that's looking around in a dark room and thinks the universe is made of light. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> See, I mean, it's abs and and from its perspective, like that's a fact, even yeah. though it's completely untrue. Yeah. Yeah. Objectively, a fact, measurably a fact. Yeah. This, but uh, the the question is, what I'm getting at is, does one approach, um, say knowledge? It may be a little abstract, but I think it, it fits. Um, in a manner that is respectful of information, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in a manner that you want to contribute to information being valued, respected, honored, and uplifted. Right. Do you want to be a person who wants to create new information for other people to enjoy i would say this is a love-based way of going about your relationship to knowledge okay mm -hmm. or do you want to be somebody who um cherry picks as like a consumer a smorgasbord of stuff that then validates preferences that you've had since childhood or that your culture has told you are important right mm. Are you a taker of knowledge, not a maker of knowledge, right? Are you uh, more inclined to challenge knowledge through uh, gambits that resemble power more than relation? Mm -hmm. You see where I'm going with that? Yeah. Like, I, I, I do see, again, I'm, I'm advocating for this conviction that I've come to, to hold that um, the skill set of relating is deep. I mean, what should terrify us about the male-female relationship and the problems that people have in male-female relating is that in a lot of ways, 
the male female relationship because it is so overt, right? It is so transparent. It's so in your face. In some ways, it is the simplest of relationships you will ever have. Simpler than your relationship you'll have with your inner voice. Simpler than the relationship you'll have with your um, environment. Simpler than the relationship you'll have with your economy. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, with and with you, one caveat that it, people... If you botch it there... Mm-hmm. I mean... The, the other advantage is that recognizing this to be the case, and this sounds very tantric now, but I mean, the point is that is the best sandbox, the male-female relationship, because again, it is so transparent and so overt. It's the best sandbox to develop your relating skills. It's very testable. It's very tactile. And if you get I, I good agree. at relating in that domain, you will be able to parlay those skills that you've learned there with Chicky Poo in a manner that will greatly aid you. Anywhere else, in, yeah. Everywhere else, right? I've often said uh, something similar to to trolls and people who say, oh, human, you, you always use the example of relationships. Can you talk about something else? It's like, well, if you can overcome and get good at your you know hardwired fears and your freudian you know uh, connection to your mother like if you can say no to that and have boundaries and know what to say and really be yourself and have that good inner voice with the woman and be completely transparent there everything else isn't as big a problem your a man's biggest challenge is a woman and they'll say, well, you're obsessed with women. It's like, no, you're, it's, it's just evident by where guys are fearful and afraid and nervous and shy. And it's like you master yourself in relation to women, everything else. You can use, as you said, that toolkit everywhere else. And you can automatically figure things out just by intuition alone. Sure. Uh, so I, I agree with that. It's but, uh, but people, I think they're again. It's it's very hard for the person that's determined to be the five year old eating chocolate cake for breakfast, lunch, and dinner to want to get healthy, to decide I've had enough of this. I've had enough of feeling sick. I've had enough of the conversations with these other children. I'm turning up, and every conversation, I'm just watching myself. I feel alone. I, I can't talk to these people anymore. Uh, and until you come to that, you, you they'll just resist you. It'll just be a power dynamic, as you said. And sure. you, you mentioned the, oh, what did you mention just a while ago about um, truth? Um, you mentioned something about uh, truth. Like, well, uh, knowledge, more than, no more than truth, right? Yeah, uh, knowledge, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it escapes me, but there was something oh, there. Yeah. The well, I mean, what I was saying is that it, it is worth contemplating the posture that one has towards knowledge or what mm. you call knowledge, right? Because what you call knowledge creates your reality. Yeah. And if, 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 if your knowledge... Um, comes to you from more or less stealing it, plagiarizing it, cherry picking it. You defend it mostly through power. Yep. And tyranny. <laughs> what kind of world do you think you live in? What What's your reality going to look like? Yeah, I remember what I was going to say um, in relation to that. I've always found it helpful if you remember one overarching principle that helps you make sense of, say, a, a not a complex notion like this, like power and knowledge and and, 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 and and everything you just said, but that if you can adopt one posture that will automatically solve a lot of these problems, it's uh, what you mentioned there about knowledge. If, you, if uh, you don't have a good relationship with it, you'll always go to power, is that if you make sure, and this is something I always have to remind myself because it's not automatic, that if you stay curious, you won't be reaching for power. If you stay curious, you can be humble. 
If you stay sure. curious, you can learn more, you can refine, you can admit you're wrong. You can try, you can have courage, fuck up and say, yeah, I failed, I was wrong. So if you're curious, yeah. you can't be angry. So yeah. that curiosity, like th th that kind of central overarching thing, I think some of those things help um, smooth out like about 10 different things underneath it that you're always trying to keep a balance on. So uh, sure. if you just keep an air of curiosity, it helps you be humble and open-minded enough that you're not reaching for power to make yourself certain. If you're reaching for curiosity for your certainty, then you're going to be a better person, I think. Oh, yes. But I mean, of course, we're getting back to the same issue. A, a person can only be curious if they are confident enough in their reality that they can take the risk and the gamble, maybe right, maybe wrong, of expanding their view of things. Mm. Like you can't, you cannot possibly um, be curious about things if the discovery of new information threatens your paradigm. Yep. Yep. If it's if it's all held together in some power trip of prejudice, well, then you will never be curious. Well, look at the leader, like a, a tyrant. Yep. He, he can't to his subjects or followers say, well, I was wrong. You know what? This person that we were all against, they could be right. If you've got a YouTube channel and you've always got a very certain type of shtick that you always go towards, you know, women right. are stupid, we're, we're perfect. And then all yep. of a sudden, if you, you, you cannot have a woman in a podcast saying something that's correct and you're going you know what you have a point yeah i agree with you you can't you just can't no. if you if you're if you if your reality is power based you have to keep re uh, your football team is better than everyone else's and you cannot um respectfully agree with the enemy you can't sort of respect and say my enemy is correct here i need to respect something about them because it's not us against them, it's the values. Like we have to respect certain values. And even if our enemies exhibit those same values, we have to say, well, there's nothing wrong with that. And we have to admit it. But unfortunately, the, that power-based dynamic, if you rule only by perfect power, you know, they're always incorrect and we're always correct. It's very political. It's very left against right. Yeah, and obviously, I mean, with some internal reflection, it becomes obvious that it's a very weak position, right? It's it's a position that comes from fear and weakness. Mm. That's why you gravitate towards power. People that are skillful and courageous and strong have the luxury of entertaining more constructive ways of relating to anything, mm. right? But if you're fragile, power is all you have. You can't take the chance. You can't recover from an error. Well, this is one thing that I think a lot of guys don't like to hear. They have this power fantasy in their heads. They almost talk like they're at a comic book convention. And sure. <clears throat> you tell them, okay, all this stuff about macho and I'm powerful and women are nothing. Why, when you go on a date, does she feel more powerful than you if you're so powerful? Yeah. Why? That kind of goes back to a lot of what we're saying. You, you actually aren't. Yeah. You don't believe that you're as powerful as your comic book friends and you keep going on about. It's yeah. it's 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 uh, Tony Robbinsing yourself in the mirror and telling yourself, I am powerful, I am powerful, but you don't believe it and you don't feel it and it's not who you are. And you know it when the lights go out at night, when you try to go to sleep, you feel the reality and you feel the reality in front of pumpkin on a date. Yeah. You are a groveling, hormonally driven five-year-old whose prefrontal cortex is switched off and you will do, you will lay down in traffic uh, for this beautiful angel in front of you. She's much more powerful than you with all your intellect, all your knowledge about men and women. You're an expert. You're a Jedi and you get in front of a figurative cockroach in front of you, and the cockroach is as big as Everest, and you're an ant. Why? Yeah. Why? Because your well, worldview I mean, is bullshit. 
Well, of course it is, you know, and, and we should know that. I mean, I, I think a person would have to be pretty naive about uh, just the biologic reality of, you know, the human troop, you know. I mean, young, attractive women have tremendous inherent power. Mm -hmm. Like if we're just caught talking about playing a power game, they have power. I mean, historically, young, attractive women sway the fates of empires. Yeah. They do. Like, I mean, almost no man you know has anywhere near that kind of punching ability. I don't even care how rich he is. Well, the most, uh, uh, I think, uh, historically well-known example is Troy. The war sure, of right? Troy. Just classic. Yeah. <clears throat> so, but, I mean, knowing that, would it not be dumb as a man to then adopt a power-based way of relating, knowing you're going to get your ass handed to you? <laughs> yeah, fight like I'm, against I mean, like. It, yeah, <laughs> I'm not necessarily, like, but... Yeah, I mean, like, who would be the most, quote-unquote, powerful man in the world today? Like, who, <sighs> who would that be? Elon Musk, you know, one of these, Bezos, one of these, who knows? Yeah, something like that. Look. Are we talking real are, power like a Rockefeller? Yeah, exactly. But I tell you what, there's a 25-year-old woman that will have him on her his knees instantly mm. if we're talking about real power. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, if she was able at wielding it, fortunately, most of them aren't that clever. Mm -hmm. But if, if they were, like, there's just simply no way. So men are, I mean, with the exception of physical violence, um, really at a disadvantage in the power game. And, and uh, because we've been used to um, having that ace up our sleeves modernity has effectively taken it away and yes, now correct. and we're not really adept at uh, the psychological warfare or the skill and no. cold coldness and, and and the um yeah women are really skilled and we've never really had to be that skilled because we had kind of a physical power and you know this visuospatial dominance and and all of those kind of factors that are different but sure. now it's it's really a woman's world and uh, in terms of the social script and how the politics are engaged to kind of um, who's yeah, in I charge. Mean, and more, I mean, maybe, maybe a more accurate way of saying that or that would make me feel more comfortable is to say that the attributes that uh, women most easily are endowed with are more value, valuable in modern society than the traits that men are naturally endowed with most often. Yeah, they're very, they're much more useful today as well. Yeah. So, um, which of course is why one is seeing, um, especially in young men, kind of an androgyny in um, many of the ways they choose to relate because they are learning from women the ability to be catty and manipulative and because that gives them power in the environment, right? To be status-seeking, to be hyper-focused on appearance, right? Well, there's a, a lot of f female kind of mentorship out in society and in media, and that's where they're learning their me messages from, whereas the male style of mentorship is either very cartoonish. Yeah. Um, or non-existent or censored. <clears throat> so it's like, well, to a clueless guy who really maybe didn't have a, an old school father around or a confident father around, which is uh, increasingly more and more just the, the norm. Oh, even, sure. if they do, even if they do have a, an actual father in the house, he might as well not be there. You might as well have one and a half women in the family. Sure. Um, th that guy's like, well, what works? Okay, this gets me, this gives me a social life. This yep. gives me at least some sort of in with women. Yep. Whereas the guys like um, 
however cartoonish it might be, the the, the top five percent of you know the guys that get to a lot of the women fairly effortlessly because they have a bit more confidence or risk taking or whatever. Sure. They they don't actually they haven't had mentors they haven't talked to men enough to kind of even bridge the gap of how to get to somewhere like that. They look at an Andrew Tate and obviously he's a cartoonish example, but sure. uh, objectively take away the you know the, the the performance of what he does online. Just objectively yeah. w- what he's able to do and the confidence by which he can kind of create his life. A guy looks at him and he has no idea of the map to get to anywhere even part way to his life but he looks at the way he's grown up in school and the androgyny and talk like a woman act like a woman then at least you'll get something in life that he's familiar with sure but the 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 masculine kind of guys like a, a bit of what andrew tate shows it's like a movie it's like i don't know how to get there i have no clue i have no language it's entertaining. I wish someone could press a button and I could just be him, but I sure. don't know in a masculine sense how I could press that button. But I know how to, I've been taught how to be feminine and how to not say certain things and how to repress certain parts of myself to get along. And so guys are almost like learning how to wear feminine masks in order to survive in the world rather than to. Uh, alleviate a lot of the the stress and fear that they have inside of them because of the way they they're being forced to to pre- present and things like that. If that makes sense, absolutely, it makes sense. I mean, but I think if if there was a message that I could get out to guys that find themselves in predicament, uh, even though it's a natural, I mean, I, I can it's a natural thing. I can see why a, a rudderless young guy would look at Andrew Tate and think that that appears i mean who knows how much of that is true or not or you know whatever i mean a lot of it's reality tv right yeah like um and certainly nobody knows what the inner workings of tate's mind happen to be and how comfortable an environment that is and i'm pretty sure it's not really very pleasant no um it's a presentation, though. We will never know yeah, what his actual. Yeah, is yeah. Like. I mean, I, I, I'm empathetic to that. Like, mm-hmm. that is such a stupid game to play, <laughs> right? It, I mean, it, it would be the stupidest game to play. If, if you actually are intelligent and honest about assessing what your need really is, and that is fundamentally some kind of sense of meaningful connection with other. Mm. I, I mean, you're not going to get that through being a cheap example of Tate or a cheap uh, alternative, right? I'm trying to you place just... myself in in the in the shoes of someone who grows up with nothing but Tate as an example of virtue, because it's kind of like in today's time. If you look at online as being a library of books, there are no books that sound like what you and I are talking about now. There are no books in the YouTube library that sound like this. So no, there are the, the 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 library that they're reading from, that they're consuming, they're learning from, is a library of these masculine role models in their eyes. Say, yes. So it's it's it's, it's very hard, and and what we talk about is very kind of theoretical or almost fiction like or. Yesterday, it was a it was a different time when we were naive and men and women were different and men acted differently. But uh, you know what? We've got iPhones now, and you need to evolve and move with the times. But I would say, okay, I, do you like the evolution now? Do you feel good? Do are you more nervous? Do you need m- more therapy now than your grandfather did? Do you objectively? Do you think you're braver than your grandfather do you have more courage can you sleep better uh is your life more complicated do you feel more confused like they don't care about that just uh, i don't want to think about all that very important questions right i mean i would say i mean in in context of say like the since the last time we talked about this stuff in a in a big way Mm -hmm. and i and we certainly talked about this sort of thing, right? Um, four years ago or whenever it was. Um, I mean, I can certainly see 
for myself, although, I mean, I held many of these ideas then, I, I mean, for sure, I've just gone further with it, right? And right. I've, right. I've found it to be of just tremendous value to be very conscious of um, the nature of your relationship with everything and yep. to as much as possible come to every given environment with the idea that you're going to be the one that comes in there and makes it richer. Mm. Right. It, and I mean that my sailing lifestyle obviously makes that easier. Um, but I mean, that's part of the way, part of the reason I live this lifestyle. And certainly it makes this lifestyle richer too, just because that is a leading principle. Mm -hmm. right? And it's become more um, conscious and overt and less abstract as I've gone along, right? And it's not, a, it's not a simple thing, but over time it becomes a habit. Just like anything. Especially yes. if if your previous habit was kind of like the roots were deep, it takes a conscious, repetitive other habit to kind of start pulling them up over time. Otherwise, those roots just kind of double down and start going into the ground again. You have to physically, slowly over time, form another habit intentionally to sort of pull those roots out. Oh, absolutely. Like, I mean, and... and I mean, it, it's gotten to be such a part of the person that I am that I forget, like, what I was like as a young man, right? Who sure. was very nervous and very cowardly and very anxious, right? Just neurotically anxious. Oh, look, me too, man. People yeah. might listen to us and think that we were like this. I think that the reality is people who are get into philosophy and read and, and try and really work out the core problems of what it is to be a human being and try and work out life in a very personal way, we're on the other opposite end of the end. Like we were really searching for it. It's not like, yeah, I already felt this way and I read books that confirmed what I already felt. It's like, no. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> Right. I didn't. I didn't go looking for mirrors. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely not. Right. But it's yeah, interesting. I mean, it's, it's it's interesting what you said. Like when you sort of said compared to when we first when we last talked, that I would say I've I've changed, but I'm all, I, I've, I feel like I've always been changing and evolving. But I've had a course. The core me's never really moved. I've just kind of shifted, expanded, thrown a few things overboard refine some other things you know uh basically change the dial but the core of me has stayed the same sure but, and and it's funny to me when you listen to the comments online if you do change especially for the better and you think you have changed for the better people will yeah. criticize you for changing yeah. and it's amazing with these guys that again using the five-year-old analogy it's like if you've changed you're a dishonorable person and your reputation's ruined but it's like I, you need to change to evolve. Like it's a good thing, and but the rhetoric is no, you shouldn't change. And I know that the powers that be love that. You know, stay a five year old, think you're right, don't move. But if you do move, if you do grow taller, if you do get more mature, if you do throw away certain things, if you do become more confident, if you care less, if you fear less, that's a great thing. You know, I, of course I want to change and fear less. Like, why would I want to be as fearful as I was? Of course I want to learn new words and new information. Uh, and just that kind of shaming language of you've changed. It's like, yes, I have. And yeah. there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah, I mean, a coward can't entertain change. No. Be because in, in order to entertain ch the possibility, it's like curiosity. Mm -hmm. yeah, you have to acknowledge the fact that there may be information outside of the domain that you currently hold dear that you may discover. Some of it may really upset you. Yeah. Right? Some of it may force you to live your life differently. Some of it may, might make it look like the person that you are right now is foolish. Yeah. Right? And can you, can you face that? Yeah, can you face that? And 
Well, if you can't, then being rigid and dogmatic and ideological and set in your silly ways forever is your path. It's a very boring, <laughs> dumb, mundane path, but it's your path. I wonder I how mean, many people in this current uh, few generations of like growing up in a social media world where this the, the online space is their reality how many of them later on will have a midlife turning point I, I don't see very many of them doing it no you know um where they do make a fundamental shift a fundamental change no i mean you know i mean i i mean i think there's a reason Right. I think one of the things that handicaps us today, um, and this gets back to the male-female thing, I mean, there is this nostalgia uh, for how, you know, perhaps our great-grandparents got along, and there's a perception that they were somehow better at relating or the values were different. You know, I'm mm. personally not super convinced that that's the case, Right. I, I think that basically it was a matter of uh, love and power and a lot of disagreement. And I don't think it was yeah. a lot more, ro well, not more rosy, but, but what I can easily I think make the case for is that in most of the aspects of whether it was hubby's or chicky poo's life, they had their hands in some other domain of relating that was very real. Yes. Okay. Exactly. And, yeah. And because of that, they were forced to have a toolkit that was mm -hmm. stronger. Yeah. Because you at least needed to be able to relate to a, a you know a, a mule train or something. You can't do that by just being an idiot, right? Yeah. Or saying yep. mules are dangerous and they're only transactional, right? Like you, mm. you've got to have an objective, functional, skillful way of relating to say mules okay and the truth is that will help you relate to other things and i think that most people live lives of so little consequence where almost nothing they do matters well they 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 have a tactile less existence Basically, and yeah. our forebears had that tactility. You mentioned that they had this skill set, but it's based on the tactility of life. Looking yes. at someone's face, uh, yeah. a promise being broken, you know, help me shift this couch. What? You said you promised to do it. Help me move this. Uh, th this real, you know, um, body language. Yes. Uh, micro expressions in the face. Yep. Uh, time, you know, I'm going to meet someone at the station and they'll be there and I'll see that when they turn the corner and I get to feel something by seeing something real in front of me and hugging them and just the, all these senses, time and space and the, the, the tactility of life just gave them this really abundant and colorful toolkit. Now it's, <laughs> it's, it's just a, a tactile life. And I met, I, I touched on some of this in my tribute to Spetsnaz, uh, recently where it's no it doesn't surprise me that so many people respected him and thought well of him but this guy kind of actually touched life and he moved things around and and all of this stuff about men and women was like a three-dimensional object you hold in your hand and you turn it around and you throw it out in life and you interact with it you come back and we can talk about it like this but um, how are you supposed to talk about something if you don't have a tactile experience? How are you supposed to have values and ethics if they're not actionable, if you don't yeah. grab them? You know, I feel like these guys are, you know, creating a bigger and bigger suitcase with no handles on it. You know, you, you, you have to grab at something. Sure, sure. And, you know, I think it's probably important to also recognize that, you know, they... It's important not to have a bunch of nostalgia either about the fact that I'll bet you my grandfather that had the mule train wasn't particularly interested in mules. <laughs> okay. Like, he didn't get to go know mules because that was his life's passion, right? <laughs> it's just that the nature of human existence, maybe a century uh, before us, was just inherently more raw and very mm. few people had the luxury of being um, 
comfortably isolated from the viscera of existence, you know? In, in the similar way of his relationship to the mule, men and women were forced to have that real relationship to each other. They didn't necessarily, they didn't care about the other, the opposite sex, but they just had to be very skilled in shaking hands with each other and interacting with each other in a very tactile sense, you know? Yeah, I mean, so it's, way, it's, more, way more skin in the game at all levels, right? And it was very practical and we didn't sort of intellectually mull over this. Of course, there were some philosophers back then that, that did, but that, I think those those were oddballs like Nietzsche or Schopenhauer that really were th not very social anyway, and right. they had to intellectualize their relationships because they weren't just actively knowing about it by touching each other and rubbing shoulders with each other. And now everyone goes to these antisocial oddballs for yeah. their rule book. And it's like, well, they weren't actually great examples of... Uh, going on dates and fitting in yeah. and being able imagine, to talk to someone. Imagine going on, a, you know, like, imagine, I mean, this should be a sitcom. Like, you have, like, Schopenhauer <laughs> and Nietzsche as, like, um, dating advice. Pick, pick up artists. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, the guys, but, I mean, this would just mirror our environment so much. Like, the guys that absolutely had no chops. Yeah. like are, are looked to as somehow paragons of wisdom and something they by their own admission could not do yeah right like i mean can you imagine going out and reading a book by a guy who uh fell off a bicycle once on how to ride sport bikes yeah i mean it'd be silly right yeah yeah but, but then uh, again, people will choose to cherry pick what confirms their biases rather than having the courage to want to actually find a solution to their problem. That's and, and the more I, I do again. But yeah, the more I go about this, whenever I, I get sucked into the autopilot, whether it's, you know, creating content like which you've probably seen, like I'll sometimes uh, over the years, I'm going down the right path. And then, you know, I just produce I almost phone in the, the, the video or give people what they want to hear. Sure. And then again, then you do another one that really resonates. And then it's like, no, I should be doing more of this. I need to, and it's, you know, this constant sort of struggle to stay on the right path. But if you really, if, if you don't even have the curiosity to pay attention to that and understand like, no, that's actually more correct. That's true. That's giving me answers. This is more the correct, correct way to live. And this is a message that will, help both me and other people rather than confirm our fears and our right. anxieties and tell us that that we're right like schopenhauer or somebody or or nietzsche who died alone talking to pigeons you know like the, the the courage getting rid of the fear and all of that sort of stuff seems to be the way through and the first step is as you mentioned the 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 ability not to have fear speaking to yourself and to have a good relationship and conversation with yourself and i found that once i started to really pay attention to that then the words coming out of the my mouth were more confident they were more reasonable they were giving me more solutions on dates with friends with family and things like that rather than having to put a mask on the words that i said to people to avoid conflict to uh to not say what i really felt and and not to live the life i really wanted to live around people um sure. but uh yeah the, the guys that are listening to this or continue to want to watch the the fun stuff online that really doesn't provide you much other than laughing at somebody else it's it's well, kind of a poor it, it, a poor way to feel better well yeah but it also has a terrible cost because those goofy exploitive clickbaity channels are creating a reality yeah, that they are normalizing a uh, a way of looking at the world that's a world that you live in, and it's diminished because of that. Right? Well, the you also the world is worse because of that stuff. Yeah, but that's one step later once you become aware of it. But let's take sure. a step back and and look from their level. If 
you get off on, you get energized by drama like this, the reality TV style drama. If that's what relationships look like to you, that's what fun relationships and relating looks like, then if you actually get a decent person, you, it'll just be white noise. You, you, oh, yeah. it, doesn't, it doesn't look like a relationship to you. So all the things that these popular shows get off on and make them feel good and energize them, which is all the drama and the conflict and you're dumb and I'm smart, that is what makes sense. And they talk about, oh, I wish I had a, a, a really calm, reasonable person to have a relationship and start a family with or whatever you're in, you, you want, right? Even if you got it, it doesn't look like a relationship because your entertainment, like you, we talk, you talked a moment about uh, relating and, and I've made videos of this in the past where I, I kind of think that everything in your life is a relationship from things to people. Sure. If you're being, if you're being entertained by this stuff and they say that the five closest people in you are generally your makeup, but also your entertainment, if all you watch, if your feed of videos that you click on habitually every day that stimulate you is these podcasts with OnlyFans chicks and let's talk about how the worst kind of woman is, fellas. It's like, sure. if that's what women and dating look like to you, A, no wonder you're scared shitless and you don't want to go yep. near it. Two, that's what love looks like to you. And, to, and, and, and it's no different to child psychology. You, if what you observe with your parents looks like love and affection, then no wonder you try and replicate it or you're afraid of it later on in your life. You so know. whatever you're exposed to is the reality that you actually get imprinted on you going forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, for good or ill, like you, you are given this, you are given this toolkit, right? Mm -hmm. And unfortunately there too, you discover that power is often more important than love. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, when guys like us mentioned love, most guys out there listening will cringe and yeah. say it's very feminine. And they'll say, yeah, even more reason not to, to listen to this. But uh, all your fair forebears, including Marcus Aurelius and all the Stoics they love to wheel out as proof of their sure. masculinity, talked yeah. about this stuff very seriously. You know, where do you think all the best art come, came from? Um yeah, a man love of your brother, love of the world, love of everything. Yeah, I mean, a man who winces at this is a guy that has <clears throat> feminized, in the in worse sense, view of love. Mm. He does. He doesn't have a constructive. He can only think of it from the point of view of a uh, power dynamic. That's all he's ever experienced, right? <laughs> Yeah, if he loves, if he laughs at love, if he winces, if he's repelled by it, if he laughs at it, then yeah, power wins. Power's the only thing that's going to make you feel good in life. Yeah, yeah. And he'll quote really bad stuff about evolution that he doesn't understand and a bunch of other crap. You know, like, I mean, one of the things that is so interesting, right? I mean, thinking of evolution. I, just because of where the world is, I mean, obviously, there's tremendous amounts of good research out there where people are trying to attempt, especially from a systems point of view, like what creates a biological system that is has the characteristic of uh, persistence, right? Like, how, why, let's say that you have an ecosystem that persists for a half a million years, why, right? And there is a really good answer to that. Right, and it's a very simple answer: is that you have ecosystems, which are relationships, of course, mm -hmm. that persist when the players within the ecosystem are all value-creating entities. Yeah, they're cooperating. Well, not necessarily cooperating; they could be competing at a at least a superficial level. Okay, but. If let's say that you've got, uh, uh, let, me, let me think of something really simple, um, a plant and some animal that feeds on the plant, right? Right. Well, yeah. the plant creates food for the animal, right? Yeah. Okay, and we'd say, well, see, but the animal is preying on the plant. 
Well, except that the animal is creating compost for the plant because it'll get bigger store value, store energy specifically, and it'll die there nourishing the root, the roots of the plant that grows for the next generation of animals. Yes, yeah, kind of like the, the cycle of, of, of the ecosystem that happens. Yeah, and the, the point is, and you could argue and say that is a love-based way of relating, where the organisms are operating in a manner that they are deliberately concentrating energy and returning more of it to the environment than they are extracting over the long run. And right. the environment uh, consistently survives over a longer period of time. But if you just, if it's a one way street, then it'll just end. Yeah, it just ends and it ends quick. And and this is what a lot of the guys in the in the dating advice scene don't realize. It's kind of like, how much can I just take from this, the little ecosystem of my dating life and have the most riches at the end and I can high five all my bros when I reach yeah. 50. I, I'm the winner. I'm at on the top of the podium. But it's, it's not, uh, th th like you said, I don't think they, they really want to relate. They want to win and wins related to power. This is why so often uh, in so many cultures you saw real resistance from wealthy individuals um, to elevate the position of their minions, you know, because they knew that it wasn't so much a matter of the money that you have. At some point, it becomes valueless to you because you have so much of it, you don't even know what to do with it, right? Mm. But money gives you a tremendous amount of power over other people who don't have it. Yeah, whereas if it's spread around, like... In, in terms of an ecosystem, it can kind of flow back and forth. Uh, exactly. Whereas if but it's all on one end, the kind of the seesaw is in balance. Yes, and there's no power to be found, at least not disproportionate power. Because, I mean, if it doesn't matter if you have a lot of money, near as much if you've got a lot more money than other people. Mm -hmm. Right? Having a lot more money than other people gives you benefits at least in the short term that massively outweigh having a lot of money around other people that have a lot of money mm. well you, you just look at you just believe your eyes you look at somebody who's married their childhood sweetheart they're they're sure. genuinely happy they've got a family it's all very traditional you talk to him at our age and he's very content. He doesn't feel like he's missed out on anything. And he's had a good life. And he doesn't envy the hookup culture. And then you talk to someone who's been in the adult industry and has thousands of partners and is like, he's lived the Andrew Tate lifestyle. And not just how he looks, but he's he doesn't look happy and he's always frustrated and he's worried about the future and he regrets his past and whatever it might be. Just believing your own eyes it's like uh, he, he didn't hoard women and money. He, uh, do you know what I mean? Like uh, people think yeah. that like I hoard enough, like I, I bang thousands of chick as many as I can until the grave. And then at the grave, I'll get my reward. I'll have a, you know, yeah, you'll have some adventures. It's like, you know, if you travel the world, you'll have things to think about. But when sure. it comes to people and being cruel and having this uncooperative selfish life where you just laugh at sp stepping on people's necks and, and every and think you can accumulate that and then later on you feel like you've won just look at people who haven't done that and they've got less stress and they're more they're much more satisfied with how their lives have gone they don't feel like they've missed out because they've they've banged one one or 50 less chicks than you have they don't care. Sure. Sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I work for a lot of really affluent people, on occasion very, very affluent people with very, very expensive, massive mega yachts, right? Yeah, I saw a recent video of yours where you were on one. Yeah, yeah. So, like, I mean, th this is a class of people that I commingle with on occasion that a lot of people don't hang with very often, right? And I can tell you that they are not conspicuously happy people, at least the ones I encounter, right? 
The, um, I've, I've I've talked to one or two of them in passing, and I find them very odd. Um, they're very strange person. They're friendly, can but be. Um, yeah, it can be, can be. Yeah. Uh, but the ones that are friendly, the ones that can be, they, they're very odd. It's almost like someone's mechanically operating a human being in the background. Yeah, I can see that. Do you know what I mean? Right. It's it's sure. kind of a just like the little inflections of words and uh, the way they form sentences and things. It's kind of um, yeah, it might just be different worlds. But anyway, well, it's something again. I mean, again, it's a power dynamic sort of circumstance, right? So, like, very often people are motivated to try to accumulate really disproportional wealth because of the power that's inherent in it, right? Here's where you don't win is that it makes it almost impossible to encounter another human being who isn't aware of your massive wealth, right? I mean, because obviously you lead with this, right? Mm -hmm. And basically the only motivation that anybody has towards you is to get some of it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, which, which again is a power dynamic thing, right? Yeah. Uh, how, how would a person... How would a person like that ever possibly have the hope of finding a genuine loving relationship? How, would, how, would that, how does that even happen? You, you'll never, even if you're curious enough and you're open enough, you will never fully trust that the people around you truly value you as a person. And you shouldn't because they're probably there because they just want a piece of you. Mm. Uh, immediately springs to mind out of my child um, high school friends of which I'm in contact with all of them one of them is very wealthy I mean <clears throat> garage full of 10 supercars wealthy yeah. and he's on his own and he's the most infuriating person and sure. uh, and and I can tell and I honestly even within myself at times I He's entertaining to be around because of his cars and the flashy things and his parties and things like that. And we all have a good time. We re remember how we were in high school and how this guy's life is completely different. But he is uh, a very cruel and controlling person and you can't sit around him for very long. And he's uh, very control focused and sure. all the people around him. And, and he's very neurotic as well. He's the kind of person that has to have the cup a certain way and he when he cleans his cars he brags about how he gets a toothbrush and he cleans every part of the engine and everything's yeah. proper and clean and his diet's perfect and he goes to the gym in the morning at this time and his life is very much mechanically driven yet all of his neuroticism is based around he's he's not he doesn't know how to be a person no so like you know, here's here's a good question to ask about people like that or about any of us, right? So, like, when you see that behavior, what is the what is the unmet fundamental unmet need? Obviously, it's not something he's getting met because he's hammering that button really hard, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But what is the fundamental unmet need that gives him the drive to persist in that behavior? even though obviously it's not satiating it, that behavior or that need at all. Cause if it did, you'd quit. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, if you're hungry and you eat intelligently, you're not hungry forever. Mm -hmm. Right. You stop at some point, but I mean, yeah. there's, there's some inherent need that he's not doing a good job of meeting. Right. And what is it? Well, uh, in terms of what we're talking about, it's probably love. Yes, he doesn't even know course. what love looks like. Nope. No, it's all power. Not. Yeah. All and look, power. it makes it makes sense without going into his childhood. You, you know, his his mum abandoned him when he was three. Sure. And uh, his whole life is being very he's been he's become very successful. And uh, sure. you know, hats off to him. But he's always had a very mistrustful attitude with life, women, and everything. And he's hyper focused on status, um, power, things like that. He sure. wants to be good. I can tell. Like he 
he does read a lot of uh, spiritual stuff. And when we do connect, we talk about, I, I talk to him about this kind of stuff whenever I can, and he's open to it. And you could tell there's like a, a five-year-old inside wanting to come out, but right. he's built such a thick, powerful wall around himself sure. that it's it's really hard to for that five-year-old to, to feel comfortable poking its little tortoise head out to, to speak to me. And it's rare that it comes out, but sometimes it does. But it's almost like he's he's puppeteering the little five-year-old. Uh, it's, it's, it's really sad in some ways to see, but he's just created this fortress of himself for so long. I don't think he'll ever change. And uh, he's never really trusted women. He's very, very mistrustful. Uh, so much so that we've had a falling out. I haven't spoken to him in like uh, two two or so years. Yeah. But um, he's just, you know, if you don't um, submit to his power and his world, yeah. he, uh, he gets pissed off. Sure. Sounds like a delight. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but I, I, I meet a lot of guys just like that. Right. <laughs> just like that. Uh, but look, I mean. Uh, go ahead. Oh, well, I mean, I was just what the kind of the big question is there. Let's say that. Let's say that. You had a guy like that, all right, and maybe for some reason, um, he might listen to a couple of guys like us riffing on on this stuff, and he could put put his armor down for a moment and say, "Hey, you know, maybe there's something to this stuff," and I'd like to try some of this love stuff that these guys are talking about. Like, I mean, really, fundamentally, what would be what would be the easiest, most actionable strategy that wouldn't make your pee pee fall off? You know, where you could, while keeping your fragile masculinity intact, practice all by yourself quietly, so that you could start making incremental s steps towards putting the losing game of power down and picking up something that can actually enrich your life. How would one go about that? Are there well, I, good examples of that? Uh, I can automatically think of something that helped me because I have okay. obviously had had very strong barriers to, to a lot of semantic words, right? Sure. So just replace that word with a synonym. So I, I might have had a problem with Say, for instance, in this example, I'm trying to place myself in my friend's shoes. Sure. Uh, love, it's feminine. No, I'm, I'm into control and power. Okay. Replace love with open-mindedness. Replace sure. love with something else that will lean you in that direction. So, yeah, okay. Love is a joke. Fine. Replace it with something comparable that will allow you to let go of your, your, your childhood toy of power. You know, some, so I, I, I think the first thing that comes into my mind is change the label to something yeah. that doesn't make you cringe, that allows you to get the benefit of of that, of, of love or whatever else uh, those things are. Yeah, that's obviously good because, I mean, I can understand the, the tendency to have these semantic reactions about that, about certain words that aren't. You know, I mean, they're ultimately prejudices and they're ultimately not justifiable. Mm -hmm. But uh, that doesn't mean that you haven't learned to have a, a well, to have a reaction. Yeah. And yeah, if, uh, if you recognize the truth behind what we're talking about, what, sure. what's what's around love, what's the ambience there? Yeah. Replace the word if it makes you feel better, but let's continue talking about that. Let's continue yeah. finding solutions in that area as opposed to your very rigid, cruel, drama-based power dynamic. Let's, if we can agree that life is better on this side, replace the label. I don't care, but continue matter. talking and focusing on these things. That's right. That's right. So I would say change the label. Uh, that yeah, would be my thing. That's that's good. I mean, because that, that, I mean, undoubtedly that's a major, I can remember that being an obstacle for me too. Because oh, I remember, remember the last time we spoke, we had a, a, a playful disagreement about the word violence. Oh, sure. And, uh, yeah. and uh, we, we talked about it and I, I could agree with where you're coming from, but I had a semantic barrier when it came sure. to that. So yeah. 
we can still agree to talk about what's correct and what's more workable and, and, and good without getting sure. hung up on semantics. And I think a lot of people with certain words, it's like, no, I'm not even going to look in that direction because yeah. the, the, the gatekeeper is that word. It's like, well, just replace the word, will you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, if, if one wanted to take, like, you know, and you get away from kind of the... the um, well, one of the one of the unfortunate aspects of of uh, terms like love is they have a lot of baggage that comes from religious tradition, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if if for nothing else, it can obviously be far too abstract, right? Like mm -hmm. silly silly statements like "God is love," whatever the heck that means, right? Yeah. I mean, like talk about a word. I mean, a sentence that means absolutely nothing whatsoever. Right, you might as well be talking about especially Santa Claus for, or something. Yeah, well, and especially for somebody that goes to work every day in a really hard and miserable world with a lot of like uh, difficulty, like that. I mean, that's that's kind of a silly thing to say. So, like, it may be very easy to draw the uh, conclusion that it's just some completely fairy tale abstraction. But if, mm -hmm. on the other hand, you take a uh, an attitude from perhaps um, evolution, okay, where you say, oh, well, that's the attribute where the the players within an ecosystem self-enrich while enriching other, right? Yeah. I mean, obviously, that's a pretty important characteristic of a lasting male-female relationship, right? I mean, in a lot of, way, a lot of ways, at a, a very, very fundamental practical level, that's what love looks like is mm. elevating, expending energy to elevate other, knowing that that enhances your environment. Yeah. Right. Well, unfortunately, like the, the, the th these kind of uh, more, not delicate, but nuanced conversations that you have to make things very basic to lead them to this point these days. They can't sure. jump jump this chasm. So like you said, instead of saying love, you need to kind of go, okay, two people over time keep their promise, they develop trust, you're able to feel good around them, then you get feelings of love. Like you yeah. need to mechanically step them through a process rather than them understanding already in shorthand how that happens. So yeah, you have yeah. to kind of like lead a toddler, you know, put these guardrails for them to go up a, a flight of four stairs, which to you is like normal. It's like, just walk up the stairs. It's like, how? Okay, put your hand here, grab my other hand, take, put one foot in front of the other. Now you're on top of the stairs. Ah, oh. so I, I think people are debilitated with the shorthand version of knowing what you mean or accepting it. Like you said, you talk about God and they'll say, well, there's not a bearded man in the sky and love is just very ephemeral, ephemeral and it's bullshit and it doesn't exist and it's a, uh, a, a modern construct born out of romance novels. So it's all bullshit. Yeah. But then if you explain it in a kind of very um, tactile, universal, uh, biological, yeah, yeah, biological right. then you step them through that, it's like, all right, now I get what you mean. But it's unfortunate yeah. that that's been lost. They, they can't just accept it as a given because we're human beings connected to the real world but unfortunately most people don't even feel that they're connected to the real world yeah i mean what we're describing is something that is an essential inherent quality it's an emergent quality in life systems right and mm. the result of having a lot of it is that the systems that have a lot of it are more persistent through time yep yeah so like how's that for a definition well i mean if you're against that or if you think that's silly, I mean, I, like, how would you not want more of that, right? Well, yeah, I mean, your, your, your car's going to run out of fuel if you don't put something back into it. Well, like exactly. It's, 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 you know, you just can't keep taking and taking and expending fuel or, or energy in one direction and never replenishing. Uh, there's got to be some sort of um, regenerative circular uh, relationship or for it to kind of continue in the long term and all these people are, that are determined that m there's no longevity in relationships between men and women and it's just a matter of time and just wait until humans wife 
takes everything he owns. It's kind of like sure. this. It's kind of like, well, you guys just have a very myopic, unskill based, unconscious, real time, re unrelatable way of dealing with life. You're sure. you're like a one of those trapdoor spiders that kind of quickly pokes their head out, grabs what they can, and then just goes back into their cave. And you just sort of survive in that way. And that's what life is to you. Have enough food to to survive in your base level Maslow's and never take a step up. Are you familiar with the uh, the Gottman Center? Are you familiar with John Gottman as a psychologist, relationship expert? I have read about him a while ago, yeah. but I can't connect what concept. Yeah. Okay. He... So I mean, they're one of the really evidence-based. He and his wife, right? They're they're probably more dominant here because they're from Seattle, right? Um, mm -hmm. Very very evidence-based, and I and I think he was, um, he has a doctorate in psychology, but he's also got he's like a statistician too. Mm -hmm. So, like, it's unusual that somebody has got very, very strong math background coupled with psychology, right? Mm. Yeah. So, um, he was trying, they were trying to come up with a very simple model of what predicts relationship durability and satisfaction, right? Mm -hmm. And um, they have one, and it's astonishingly simple, and it's astonishingly effective, um, in predicting whether relationships will be satisfactory and, and durable or not, right? And it comes down to a very simple phenomenon that they call bids, okay? And you can observe bid behavior um, in all sorts of animals, not just humans. When you see birds sitting, chirping at each other, what they're doing is they're making an investment of the energy in energy to see if another of their species hears them and replies. Mm -hmm. Because then it's an attempt to reach and build connection with other, even at a very simple level of that. So in, in human beings, it's generally a, a uh, exploratory behavior whereby, let's say that you are and... Um, your wife are driving down the uh, road in a car, you know, on a car trip. And she looks out the window and she says, hey, do you see the color on that house over there? I like mm -hmm. the color on that house. Okay. Her right. statement there is a, is a, would be a classic bid from this point of view. She is exposing something that she feels and finds interesting to you as an opportunity for you to invest in knowing more about her. Yeah. Okay? And if, if you just go, huh, and ignore her, eventually she's going to quit doing that. Yep. Okay. That's, that's the simplest kind of demonstration of what bids are. They are opportunities that are presented for... Um, and they should be seen really as a gift, right? She's offering up something about her own self, putting it on a platter there for you that you can either dismiss or embrace. Yep. That makes right? perfect sense. Yeah. Yes. It's a very good model. Couples that reciprocate bids do very well. Couples that don't, don't last at all. Yeah, it seems very logical. Even the the guys that are into the STEM based solutions. That's right. Uh, I've always said, like, if you can't talk and enjoy having endless conversations with your partner, then I don't really have faith that it'll last beyond short term at all. And if you, you can go, if you just genuinely aren't interested. Yeah. Well, I mean, they'll figure it out, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah, and that kind of interest in each other. And like, again, if the the simple stuff that people, I think, intentionally love to overlook because they think a relating just comes with it built in. Right. Like if you talk with another, it's all automatically built in. Yeah. Like the ability to actively listen and care and want to know 
and you care, you're self-interested enough in this other person that you, like if it's Chicky Poo, because you respect her and you like her, you want to like romantic movies from her eyes if she's talking to you. If she's not compatible with you, of course, she gets you annoyed. But the compatibility is important point of view. But given that you've already passed that hurdle, you know she's a match for you beyond the physical and you can talk to her and your values are similar. Then I, I even noticed with Stephanie that the things that guys would say, well, chicks are into this, guys aren't. Because it's her and because of these bids you talk about, she talks, she offers me these bids in ways that I am interested in because of the trust and uh, the way she speaks and sh and uh, she, the way she communicates. And I want to find out more and I want to listen, even if it's a, an objective topic that I'm not interested in. She might think the color red of a house is sure. great. I think blue is. She says, I love that color red. And I can talk about liking the color red from a person I'm compatible with, even if my color is blue, because we can relate to the same thing with the same language. Sure. But if if you're, if, do you know what I'm trying to say? Oh, absolutely. Right. And I, I think you can, person can take it. Uh, uh, something that is really helpful for a lot of guys who will say, like, I would be a good example of this. I can hardly sit my butt down to watch a movie, let alone a romantic comedy. Right. I mean, like, I just hate that stuff. Right. Okay. But, but from, a, from a more astute point of view, it's, it's important to know that she doesn't really care that much about romantic comedies either, right? Yeah. But there is a need there that she uses romantic comedies to meet. Mm -hmm. Okay? Certainly, if I'm capable of running an in-run around stupid romantic co uh, uh, comedies and figure out what the need that she has, that the romantic comedies are meeting, I'm probably clever enough to even come up with something better at meeting that need than romantic comedies, and I won't ever be bothered with having to watch them again. <laughs> yeah, like like uh, taking some food on a beach and sailing there and, and creating your own little romantic scene. Uh, well, uh, yeah, or whatever. I mean, it's very hard... I mean, people can have annoying preferences for sure, but the need behind the annoying preference is very human. Sure, sure. Look, okay. look at um, re look at restaurants. Like, women don't often go to restaurants, candlelit dinners, to have dinners with each other, but they do really like going to restaurants and dining out with their partner. Sure. So that's a specific need with the romantic partner. Not necessarily that she likes doing on her own or with other girlfriends. She likes doing it with her man. Sure. And what is that need? To connect with you, to relate to you on a level she can't with anyone else, including herself. Yeah, absolutely. To feel valued. Yeah. Right. Oh, look, I, I, I say to guys, if you want one one kind of singular way to to, to understand women is make her feel safe that's yeah. it make yeah. her feel safe and you've already and like if she's already attracted to you just keep your eyes on making her feel safe that means not be confident for her because she's making you feel confident she's letting you be in charge or she wants you to be in charge because she already likes you she wants to feel safe under you it's the reason yeah. why she likes taller men it's the reason why she likes guys to be in charge it's the reason why she likes guys throwing her around in the bedroom it's the re it's just a lot of it makes sense so if you need to remember one myopic you know one trick pony um meme is a woman needs to feel safe yeah and, and who uh, who begrudges that no, guys need to feel safe in a relationship with a woman as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that again, if you distill it to the need, it becomes a very human thing. And it's like, well, sure, I get it. I know why it is that you would want to feel safe, because I'd like to feel safe too. It would make me very happy to make you be feel safe. Maybe you can help me feel safe too. 
Unfortunately, a lot of guys think that they, they don't need to have any needs themselves. I've made a few videos on this, like have some needs as a guy. Yeah. Like you but, can't I mean, just be a, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, well, I mean, it's just silly though, right? A guy that says that has a glaring need for security. Well, it's it's laughable That's to me. That's why doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, it's laughable to me when I hear these guys like, I did everything for her, and then she just left me. I was like, why are you complaining about things that a woman didn't do or give for you where you explicitly told her, no, 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 I'll do that. I'll get that. I'll pay for that. I'll whatever. Like, so you didn't have any needs. Sure. And- you waited on her hand and foot and you were the stoic uh, quote unquote masculine guy that took care of everything and she was in your frame and she was this docile little lamb looking up at you batting her eyelids and it's like what do you expect you did everything you wanted to do everything you didn't ask her to wash the dishes or make you a sandwich or you didn't ask her for any little things like the, the reason why uh, we talk about the guys talk about a woman cooking for you and stuff is to just have some basic needs where someone can actually show you through action that they want to put in effort and th that they can satisfy some of the needs that you can do yourself. I can cook. I can, I'm self-sufficient. I don't need a woman for anything, but what I would really appreciate and what, what need would be satisfied in terms of what we're talking about here is that even if you have to manufacture them, offload some of the things you can do for yourself that a, a woman has the skill to do and would make her feel closer to you to do something for you. Don't do everything. Otherwise, there is no connection between you. You, you are cauterizing any possible connection by doing everything and being a hyper male. Yeah, and it makes her feel valueless. Yeah. Like, how, how, how nice is that? Yeah. Oh, she, I like her because she's insecure and uh, she's very neurotic and she feels like she's worthless and I could leave her at any moment. And that's my sense of security. It's like, really? Yeah. Is it? Power <laughs> Do you feel secure? Again. Yeah. Does it, See, does it's, it, it's weakness, power. Yeah. Does, it, does having your, your partner weak and fragile make you feel secure? Just that she'll never leave you like Stockholm Syndrome? Is that the life you want? Yeah, it's insane, right? Like, mm. it is insane. Well, until you actually reflect and know what you need, that's it. You will you will go via this superhero cartoonish script. Sure. And you will keep getting nothing back. You know that that the the story always ends in one way. And as you mentioned before, the the ecosystem doesn't keep going on. Relationships no. keep ending, and then you the, the answer you, to your question is like, well, it's because women are the same and uh, all relationships end. And you say, well, what about that couple there that's been together for 50 years? Oh, that's an anomaly. That's luck. Well, talk to them. You know? Sure. Look at the way they speak to each other and actually take a look at how they're actively relating and who they are as people. Oh, well, that's them. That's not me. I've got a temper. It's like, well, maybe you need to modify and, and work on that part of your personality. Because, like, no one likes that. You, you yeah. I've said this before. If you're in a dialogue, you can be the shittiest person who never goes for a run, who doesn't take care of their health. The thing is, you can't leave yourself. You can be as shitty as you want to yourself inside. You can have the worst conversation with your inner voice but it'll never leave you. So you get used to that. But guess what? Another person, they can fucking leave you in a heartbeat. And they if will. Stephanie and me, we, look, we wouldn't have been together. If I act shitty to her, if we don't reciprocate, we're not fair, we don't respect each other. I can't. If you don't have a good inner dialogue, another person's not going to tolerate that. They will leave. And they should, like you said, they, they should, should leave. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But... Interesting. I wish, uh, uh, I think more guys would find answers having these kind of exploratory conversations, you know, being curious, like I said, just be yeah. curious. Don't, you know, let, put down the armor. You can be wrong. You can laugh, you know, cause you could call me an idiot. I don't care. But, you know, if you have a humor about it, it's like have a sense of humor, man, because you're not going to try even if you fail. And then, you know, sure. your friend will laugh at you, but in a humoristic way with their arm around your shoulder you know you don't want to not try 
in life because you, you're afraid you're going to get thrown in the fire by the tribe. You want to try where the worst thing that'll happen is your friends laugh at you and then, then they go, here, have a beer. Sure. Yeah, and, and that's the thing that's been lost. And, and all these guys are acting like the, the, the women that they don't respect and they don't even realize it. Yeah, you know, and, and also I think there are there are attempts i mean and you can find um attempts out there to to try to communicate um maybe some a similar message than what we're trying to to convey here but often it often it's it's um reactionary so like it'll often be commingled with um kind of an aversion to classically masculine values like physical strength, prowess, even the capacity for violence, right? I, I, I don't see, I don't see the need to do that. You know, like, I mean, again, with my conversation here that I'm having with you, I work in a shipyard with a lot of really rough guys. <laughs> that's my, <laughs> like, that's my day to day, <laughs> you know, like, it, it is so far from like some pajama wear and yoga retreat. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah. like just shockingly so. And I have a tendency to uh, have a crude sense of humor and not uh, particularly, uh, I, I have a tendency to be quite profane, like a, like a good sailor. Mm. Uh, but i mean that that doesn't mean that i cannot uh i i come from you know a tradition of very old school very traditional masculinity right um well you also have the social none of this is at, at, at any kind of odds with that no they, you have the the stronger I was just going to say that because you have this sort of still tactile relationship with people, you know who you are, you know your values, you also have the tact by which to adjust yourself in certain social settings without actually humiliating yourself and changing who you are. You can adjust yourself with the sailors and swear, but you know who you are. Sure, you can you can sort of bend yourself and have a joke. Like when I tell, if you say, uh, if you have a dark sense of humor, it doesn't change who you are. No. You know, you're you're telling a joke. And when I, I work amongst people who sell motorcycles, and so sort of this some sort of comparable personality there to the shipyard guys you're with. But sure. there's also the, the the person you are inside. And so I can talk on the surface with all these guys out in the open and they've got worse mouths than I do. But then what, sometimes one-on-one -on -one in, the, in the coffee room, I'll have a conversation with one guy and I'll be asking him about life. And one guy uh, last week is telling me how he got divorced and how he yeah. left his wife. And she really did, was surprised and shocked, but he's telling me about how he hasn't been happy for a while and... He's saying how he didn't communicate and he feels like he's been living a lie. And one-on-one, -on -one, you really can have these conversations. So I think a lot of people on the surface in these groups, they have this grammar by which they, you know, uh, conduct themselves with each other like you do with jokes, surface level stuff, rhetoric, language. But when you get people one-on-one, -on -one, if they're brave enough, it's really nice to, to find out who they are and that most of us go through similar struggles, but that the... The difference is that a lot of people don't just have the courage to let go and be honest about what struggles they're having and what's important to them and, and say what they like and what they don't like. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. So, yeah, anyway. We are being led by the weakest among us, man. Well, the only thing you can do in light of all of this when people ask, uh, what, what can I do, is take care of the um your world and keep it as hygienic as possible and be as honest as possible i mean one core value as much again you can take your eyes off the ball and and we're all human beings we're not perfect because the thing is you can't be neurotically having your eye on the ball then you miss life right 
Yeah. You, you, you want to relax enough to enjoy life, but then when you relax enough to just take life in, you can drift off course a bit and you have to pull yourself back. And so life is this constant thing of like relaxing enough, knowing who you are, developing your instincts. So they're learned over time and you have good impulses, but then sometimes you drift and you have to pull yourself back and, and, and it's constant maintenance. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the guys that are constantly drifting, drifting on off, off course by consuming the wrong kind of content, listening to, listening to the, the wrong mentors, not trusting themselves and not really having these kind of discussions because I feel like having friends and people you can talk to like this, especially as a younger guy and not the, 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 the political bullshit and what happened to this politician and what do women do and feminism is like, who cares? Yeah, It's right. interesting, but it, it doesn't like, how is that going to help you talking to someone on a date? How is that going to help you? not sleeping at night how is that going to help you moving out of the neighborhood that you haven't felt comfortable in or the relationship you haven't been comfortable in how is that going to help you say no to your mother or parents or expectations of this that and the other or leave the job that you've been wanting to leave for three or four years it comes sure. from this it comes it from does. this kind of curiosity and having an internal and external dialogue like this, if you can pass the first internal point, uh, then you can do something. But um, yeah, unless someone's got the courage to kind of do this, I, I really don't know how much they can be helped. Yeah, but I think can't... it's impo it's important to say that courage doesn't come from a vacuum. You know, you know, foolhard foolhardy uh, bravado might. I mean, there are guys that might be just naturally reckless, but courage is something you got to earn. And it comes by little step, 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 and repeated effort in overcoming. Mm. And if one doesn't face challenges, you don't do any overcoming. Yep. And I would just say, so, be careful who's instructing you in terms of the map of courage you might be taking to take these little steps. Sure. Because the this kind of the, the 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 dude bro macho rhetoric of telling you where courage is is just yeah. making you be reckless, but describing it as courage and bravery and honor, but actually real courage. And I would say, look to the past because we're only here by the courage that actually worked to get us here, not this new modern version of masculinity that doesn't work no one's happy and men and women aren't getting so the only thing that objectively does work is where we've come from the the, the proof the evidence of the past style of courage so look at what that oh, looks yeah. like and what that conversation sounded like not this this is not it no no i mean and rightly so like for most of human history especially if one looks to metaphysics and it doesn't mean it doesn't matter whether this is Eastern or Western tradition and it's fundamental mystery schools. The masculine element was seen as pure, raw, creative potential. Mm -hmm. It was that that brought things into existence. It wasn't a plunderer. It wasn't about power. It really resembles love. Yeah. Yeah. All you have to do is, even as bad an instructive medium as it is, if you look at Hollywood movies, it's always the societies, the natural societies that we're living in harm with nature in harmony that look the most admirable, that look the most pristine, that looks the most beautiful. It was always these, it was always the, the, the plunderers that came into that environment, you know, the, sure. The, the explorers that found a Polynesian island and basically ruined it and, and yep. destroyed a culture that's been last, that was there for thousands of years. That's what something unsustainably short term and bad looks like compared to something that is beautiful. And, and the people that live there look as beautiful as the nature surrounding them. 
whereas sure. the plunderers look as artificial and untrustworthy as their guns and their steel and whatever. It's their toolkit. Yeah. But again, it's maybe that's cool. getting a bit too esoteric and, um, and mystical for some people. But I would say just just be as practical as possible to, to people who might be listening to this. Look at uh, very practical and simple solutions. What what does trust look like? What does a friend look like? And kind of base all of your, your, your vision around those simple sort of um, flags. And uh, you'll start to sort of go forward in a, in a way that you'll that will be sustainable. You'll know what good relationships look like. You'll know what trust looks like. You know what it takes to get there. And then you'll no longer be interested in the um, the, the drama based reality TV based entertainment that you once did. Uh, I don't I don't watch any Manosphere content. I haven't watched it for years. No, uh, I watch I watch anything in it like you know I, I watch things that were related to Manosphere content that I was interested in like psychology and um, uh, certain podcasts where people are talking about life in general pedestrian ways like sure. I, I listen to them but uh, the 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 basic myopic view of uh, everything that's been talked to death in the golden age of uh, MGTOW, like, just, no, like, I've, it's it's like listening to an old cassette from my youth. It's like, I, I listen to this, it's not revelatory. I can't be wowed by this. It's, it's yeah. like looking at old photographs of me skateboarding. It's nostalgic, but it's not, it doesn't fill me up with anything. I'm not learning anything. It's not helping me now at my age. Well, it's not a destination. It might've been a rung on a ladder. Yeah, it's. I, I kind of find it's. Uh, it's kind of like a, like when you leave Shawshank, that the, the the a lot of the really useful Manosphere information is like when you you leave the prison. You know, they 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 put you in a suit and they give you a bus ticket, and you step outside the gates. It's sure. kind of just the basic toolkit to move forward in life, and a, a yeah, lot and of guys if, just if you kind do of it well. You take you take the information that you've received there. You take responsibility for your life, even in light of the fact that there are hazards that you are now aware of, and uh, you move forward with it. Yeah, 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 and move away from the the state the safety of that liberation point, which is a lot of uh, the, the 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 velvet gloves of keeping you shackled to. The, the 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 you know the the the, rev, the the really great revelations the waking up moment in the manosphere that you feel yeah. grateful for and you kind of have that velvet glove of being shackled to it it's like it was a moment and you have to say goodbye to your friends and everything you know you take them with you you can always come back and visit and talk but you can't stay there you have to leave the gates of the prison you're free but that moment however brilliant it is yeah. Dr drink it in. It's great. It's fantastic. It's like hugging someone at the airport that you haven't seen for years. But you look like an idiot if you're still standing there two days later and you're still hugging them again. It's like you should have left the airport. Yep. Well, so. you know, I mean, maybe kind of a final thought from that. I mean, it, it reminds me of back in the day when I, you know, used to work with uh, juvenile justice system and troubled kids and stuff many many years ago seeing kids coming from just absolutely terrible homes right mm -hmm. and I, this is probably this is probably the origin point of this kind of thinking for me because i really did see kids coming from i mean it the worst right um and there's two fundamental choices that that you have and they really are as we've been discussing all night here you get to choose love or you get to choose power and it's attractive to choose power because power is all you've ever known especially if you come from an environment of violence and such like you already know how to do that yeah right and I would say probably three quarters of the kids that came from terrible homes went on to be terrible abusive people right yeah but a quarter didn't okay a quarter of them had the courage to acknowledge that that was not what they wanted to be involved with and they took responsibility to be 
the steward of a project to make their universe a healthier place to live in. Yeah. Right. By pure force of will, by pure creative intent. Mm. And those that did succeeded. Right. And they live in a different world because of that. They live in a world that is certainly more attractive than the one they came from. Yeah, and but you, you have to you have to make that face, most all of us face this choice. But again, you you have to be curious curious enough to to see something in that direction or or want to scratch the surface in that direction and Absolutely. in some ways be disgusted or sick of or tired of the circular conversations and the circular life you've had up until this point that just never bears fruit. It's just you feel like you you're living the same Tuesday and uh, calling it a life as cliche as that sounds but um, oh yeah it's like I, well, it's just thinking like you're in your 30s and then you're in your 40s like i just feel like an older version of my 30s and you feel like oh well i haven't changed i'm proud of that it's like no i should be something else uh, i feel tired and a lot of stuff doesn't satisfy anymore and i remember sure. when i went from my 20s to my 30s there was this kind of again transition to a different chapter and it's like you just stopped you stopped going forward and and you really need to and you really need to stay especially i think in midlife a lot of guys with their physical you know their sexual prowess their dating like you really have to kind of say goodbye to all that you, you're not gonna you know you, you a lot of guys think about their past and the women that they're no longer with and you know i looked great and they pictured themselves fucking at 25 and they, that was really great it's like yeah i don't like the image of me having sex now it's like you have to say goodbye to some of those perfect images and you have to live in a different way now and appreciate things differently. Sure. Sure. But um, uh, it's, it's in some ways simple, but it's not easy. No, and it's made, and it's made worse because of the lack of uh, examples of men that do this to emulate. Mm. And in some ways confusing because you've got... A million ways to be entertained online and a million people giving you answers but it just confuses you they're all there just, to facilitate you doing nothing yeah a million options leading nowhere yep and very very few honest conversations that sort of scrape away all the all the useless stuff and just leave you with the bare bones of what it is to be a, a person and, and what actually works in life unfortunately those channels don't have millions of followers and they never will and only the channels that have big followers that get reactions from controversial material will be shown to you will be f pushed in your face as soon as you log into youtube and the boring stuff that m makes you a better person um but think about it the more self-sufficient stable a person you are and you can say no to the worst stuff in life they don't want that because then you're not going to click on the banner to buy a new pair of shoes. No, of course not. So the more these these conversations, the, the kind of people who want to have these conversations and listen to them are the kind of person that is fine with one pair of shoes. Thank you. I'm not clicking on that button and I'm not going to eBay or Amazon. So you, you, you can't sell anything to me. So, nope. okay, we're not going to show you those channels. We're not going to make them popular. The attractive ones are the ones where you feel alone, neurotic, scared, and that you need to buy your way out of your misery and your neuroticism. Yeah, it's, it's like somebody pushing some kind of narcotic on you, right? Yeah. They, they, the, the intent is to keep you hooked on garbage that you'll never shake. Yep. Right? Keeping a need perpetually itchy. Yeah. <sighs> All right, dude. Um, I won't keep you much longer. Thanks. Uh, it was really great to catch up and chat with you again. Yeah, absolutely. A delight, man. Yeah, it was really great. I'll stop recording.